Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, the previous title that was given, I thought was a little aggressive, eating everything in the path, and I wanted to come with a more positive one. I'm going to talk about a future that's powered by artificial intelligence. I have the privilege of leading um, Microsoft Research in India. I'm an out-and-out -out tech guy. I, I studied here, I, I went to the US, I did my PhD in computer science uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. I lived in the US for 15 years, working for tech companies. Um, for some time I used to work for Microsoft Research in Redmond, and then um, I came here to India 12 years ago um, um, when our lab in India got started. Um, we have a research lab. How many of you have heard about Microsoft Research India? Quick show of hands. Okay, many of you show up. No. So our office is in Level Road, uh, near UB City, and um, we have a team of um, you know, scientists who work on everything, ranging from theoretical computer science to algorithms to machine learning to security and privacy to the role of technology in socioeconomic development. We have, we have a variety of things, but today I'm going to talk about a sampling of work from our lab in the area of artificial intelligence. Um, so b before I dive in, uh, to give you a glimpse of what is cooking in the labs, let me ma make a few comments about um, why, why is this disruption happening. Uh, my previous speakers eloquently talked about ubiquity of data. We have so much data um, uh, today, and the ubiquity of computing. Um, and the ability for us to crunch that data and get intelligence out of the data. In addition to that, there's a very important trend, which is that the real world and the virtual world are merging. See, when I, when I, was, uh, when I, was, when I was doing grad school at Berkeley, um, search engines were coming up for the first time online. It was very clear at that time that the real world and the physical uh, virtual world were separate, which means that computers could index and search only things that people decided to put online. In the past few years, that trend has significantly changed. We live in a world where sensors from your television, from your refrigerator, from your car, from your body, are constantly transmitting data to the cyber world. And the cyber world is constantly crunching on them, learning from them. So you are going to be impacted by AI, whether you like it or not. Um, so when I, when I go to the US, my colleagues tell me, show me a picture of a car like this one that drives itself. The reality in our country is this. And uh, um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a while before these cars drive themselves. But that said, AI is going to be important no matter where you live. Let me talk about safety. Road safety is one of the biggest health hazards in our country. Now, people talk about India being a, um, a capital of cardiovascular disease. You know, they talk about India being a diabetes capital. But an important health hazard that is so often ignored is, is, is traffic and road safety. The number of deaths, critical injuries, completely disabling injuries, debilitating injuries that are caused by road accidents in India is going up the roof. Can AI be used to help people make our roads safe? This is a project that we're doing in our lab, and I'll talk about that. The project is called HAMS, and the idea is to use existing cars. You know, we're, not, we're not going to wait for the tes Teslas to come here. And we are going to put a smartphone and tap into the OBD sensor of every car we have. And we started doing this experiment by the f in the fleet of cars that we have in our lab. So we have a fleet of cars that go pick up employees every day and drop them every day. So in every one of those dashboards, we put a smartphone and we connect the OBD sensor. We collect data, store them on a local server, and when the cars come back, we upload them onto the cloud, and then we do machine learning and analytics on the data that we collect. So what can you do with it? Let me show you how, how the system looks. So um, I don't know how I play this video. Maybe somebody could click. 
Oh, no, I want to go back. Is it this? Maybe somebody can help me uh, uh, turn on. The, okay, so, so basically what's happened is that this is what the system got after maybe one day of, um, of, of collecting videos. So these are all the cars, uh, each, each one of them. And what you see is a, the machine learning algorithm processing the video together with the OBD sensor information and giving a dashboard of what happened. Like, for example, um, you know, maybe we want to do law enforcement and we want to look for a particular license plate. And the learning algorithm can, has found that this car encountered this uh, license plate um, at that time. Um, another thing that the algorithm can detect is actually, you know, it can detect that the driver is actually talking on a phone. So they, on, on the right, you see this uh, blue, uh, blue dash that's actually detected. Um, the, the driver is talking on the phone uh, at that point in time. Now from that time to that time, how much duration the driver was talking on the phone when, when, when the car was being driven. Now imagine you know, that I equip this in every car in your transportation fleet. Imagine I equip this in every bus that BMTC runs in Bangalore. I can now run a SQL query which says, tell me the number of minutes my drivers were on the phone. And I'll get an answer. I can, I can, answer the, I can ask the query, tell me which driver talked most on the phone. I can ask the query, tell me which driver had the closest shave about to have an accident while they were on the phone. Right? Imagine actually combining that with the right to information and making this available online. That how much accountability that it will give to people who drive these big vehicles on our roads as if there is just no control or no, no controls on what they can do. Right? That, that is the power that, that AI can do. I mean, if, without AI, you could still have these, uh, these videos, but you, know, you have to have somebody watch through all of them. What AI can do is that it can it's extract intelligence out of them and, um, and, 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 and enable quality control to be done um, uh, with minimal um, uh, human, human work. Let me talk to you, talk to you about another um, verti vertical domain where AI can be of huge use. Precision agriculture is, um, is an important thing in the United States today. So a lot of farms in the US, they are now using drones to fly through the farm, collect aerial imagery. They also put sensors to detect pH level, um, water level information, to, do, to understand you know, how much irrigation you need uh, and all of these kinds of things. So we were thinking, actually, you know, can we do precision agriculture in India? So I don't, actually, first of all, drones, I think, are not even legal in India. And even if they are, I think they're too, they're too expensive. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from an agricultural family, and I know that my, my dad used to be an agricultural officer in government of Tamil Nadu when I grew up. And I know that if you put sensors in a farm in India, the only guaranteed thing is the next morning you come, the sensors won't be there. <laughs> that's the only thing that's going to happen. <laughs> Whether you do precision agriculture or not, it's a different story. <laughs> right? So we started do, doing a project where we have a helium balloon under which we mount a camera, and we give a walker a sensor pod that he carries in his hand. So the model is that this guy walks around the entire farm, collecting aerial imagery, and as he walks, the sensor information is also going to be collected, and when he goes home, the sensor goes with him. So this is the model. So we have been experimenting with this model. Uh, here are some unsuspecting interns who are driving these balloons in the farms in, um, in Bangalore. Um, so here's one of them that is... Um, uh, walking around with this balloon, and uh, the, 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 the camera and the balloon also gives them guidance on where to go. So they have, a, they have a handheld, and the camera's goal is to take an aerial imagery of the entire farm, and um, it, it, it instructs the walker uh, on, uh, on how, where to walk so that they get um, all, all the imagery. Um, so you can see now, the, this is a grad student that is launching the balloon. Um, um, th th these are the various images that the, that the balloon collects, and then the software uses AI to stitch these things together um, uh, to one uh, panoramic image, and then we could run algorithms to figure out 
uh, the moisture heat map um, of, 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 of the farm, so that we could actually solve optimization problems like, if you have a fixed amount of water, how would you irrigate your farm? It turns out that because of slopes and, and because of how water stagnates, it's much more efficient to irrigate your farm differentially than to irrigate it uniformly. So we can give guidance on that. We can actually figure out temperature maps. We can also do pest infestation. We can give early warning detection on which pests are there, and so on. Uh, so that's, that's another example of, of how AI can help us. Now I'm going to talk about something a little bit more technical. Um, in a lot of these, the current dominant model of AI is that send all the data to the cloud, and all of the intelligence happens in the cloud. That's because a lot of the algorithms, like deep neural networks and so on, they require an enormous amount of computational power and an enormous amount of memory to run. So one question that we asked ourselves is actually, do we really need that much energy and power to run AI algorithms? What if AI algorithms can run on the sensors and the devices that are present everywhere? These things called IoT, Internet of Things devices. Can you actually run AI algorithms on them? To answer that question and give, give a perspective of the scale there, let me show you this picture. This is a golf ball, and this is an ARM Cortex, and you can see how small that is. It has around four kilobytes of memory. I think uh, you know, it, it has uh, less memory than the smallest PC when I started doing computing um, in 87. Right? So can you actually run? Today what people do is that they use it to just collect data. They don't run any algorithms on it. But can you run algorithms on this device? So why, why would you want to do that? Why would you run, want to run algorithms on this? Right? Maybe you don't have connectivity all the time. Right? That could be one reason. Then you, know, then you won't have the benefit of these algorithms running. Second one is actually maybe you want to protect your privacy. You want to, maybe you don't want to send all the information to the cloud. Maybe you want to do intelligence on the device itself. There could be several reasons, right? So one of the things we're doing is um, there's, a, there's a bunch of us that are working on how can you make these algorithms work on these really, really small devices, right? We have, we have uh, decision trees. We have classifiers now that can run on four kilobytes of memory uh, with incredible accuracy. And one of the amazing things that happened after we invented these algorithms is that some of our cloud teams want to use these algorithms to even do processing on the cloud because it actually reduces cost for them. So instead of running a cog, which has uh, you know, megabytes and gigabytes of memory, they can compress the, their, their workloads, run on. Uh, so that, that is the nature of science. You know, wh what you start, um, you don't have a real idea, clear idea of where all it is going to be used. And that's one of the joys of actually working in science. The next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, something called Skype Translator. I want to show you a video of Skype Translator. Maybe you can, uh, I think, if you have to figure out how to turn this on. How many of you heard? Yeah, just, just roll this video and just watch it. Yeah. Hi, can you guess where I live? ¿Te encuentras en América del Norte? Yes. Do you live in Central Mexico? Sí. ¿Te encuentras en Estados Unidos de América? Yes. Do you live in a capital city? Sí. ¿Estás cerca de Seattle? We're very close to Seattle. Are you in Mexico City? Sí. ¿Estás en Tacoma? Yes. Very good guess. Gracias. Thank you. Do you like living in Mexico City? Te gusta vivir en la ciudad de México. Aquí está muy lindo. Here is very nice. What do you do for fun? ¿Qué haces para divertirte? Voy a las playas de México. I'm going to the beaches of Mexico. I like to swim. Me gusta nadar. A mí también. Me too. Where in the world do you wish to travel? ¿A dónde en el mundo te gustaría viajar? A Rusia. To Russia. ¿Y tú? And you? Everywhere. <laughs> Sería increíble algún día verte en México. It would be amazing to see you someday in Mexico. I would really like to visit you sometime. Me gustaría mucho visitarte algún día. A mí también. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, actually, I, I, I want to ask you a question. How many years of research does it take to do something like this? Can you guess? Actually, this was, this was running as a research project in Microsoft Research for more than 15 years to produce something like this. I joined Microsoft Research in 1999, and when I joined, we used to have <laughs> these demo booths in which there used to be one demo booth where what they would do is actually they would have speech to text. And then they would have something that converts text in one language to text in another language. They will have another demo that converts text to speech. And they would all kind of work, but not quite well. And this is all of them stitched together and all the kinks ironed out. And that's what it takes to do something like this. Um, 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 so I, I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a, a related research project we're doing in MS Arena. That's the last thing that I'll talk about. Maybe we can go to the next slide if that's possible. Yeah, OK. So um, we live in a multilingual society. Uh, you know, there we, there we saw a translation between Spanish and English. But most of us, right, my mother tongue is Tamil. And uh, when I speak, I mix with my friends. I mix Tamil and English all the time. And I know my friends, my, my wife is from Delhi. She's, she mixes Hindi and English when she talks to her friends all the time. These are actually um, uh, snippets from social media. The second one must be most familiar to people here. It mixes uh, Kannada and English. So one interesting question is, you know, be it Skype translator, or be it, be it Cortana, or be it Siri, you know, can we actually make it more natural to multilingual societies like us, where we mix languages? Right? So it would be nice if my computer agent talks to me in, in my favorite language. How do you do that? Right? So we have a project called Melange, where we are actually trying to understand how AI and NLP can work in this mixed multilingual world. Um, so here, here is actually an early demo of a translator. Let me see if I can get this going. You have to click this as well. This is a video. Can someone click this? Yeah. So you can see now um, that's, a, that's a text in multiple languages. And um, uh, what happens is that the system has detected that there is both French and Spanish involved. And uh, um, then when you translate it in English, you know, you get, um, uh, you know, something nice. Like, I mean, I don't speak, you know, it's, you know, it's apparently because it's sunny after so many days. Um, there's, there's one more that we can show. And actually, you know, as an example, you could take that and then plug it into your favorite translator today. And the translator, any, any of them gets hopelessly confused because they, they can't process the fact that these are um, 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 coming from multiple languages. And this one, I think, is both uh, Dutch and Turkish. And uh, you can see that uh, being translated as well. So I, hopefully that gave you a, a glimpse of what is cooking in, in Microsoft Research. Um, I invite you to visit our webpage, uh, Research, Microsoft Research India. Uh, AI is only one of the things that we work in. Uh, we work in theory, we work in algorithms, we work in systems. Uh, somebody talked about WannaCry. We work in security, privacy, um, and we work um, uh, on the role of technology in socioeconomic development. Um, and I, I, I look forward to more conversation with you. Thank you. Yeah.